Well, hello, everyone. This is Ken Hardison, and welcome to another episode of Grow Your Law Firm. And today we have the privilege and honor of having Lawrence LeBrock, uh, personal injury attorney uh, from up the Upper New East. We call it, uh, you're in Pennsylvania and you're in New Jersey, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that is correct. And we're in New yeah. Jersey and we have one office in Pennsylvania in beautiful Philadelphia. There you go. Yeah, where they just got a big verdict, I heard. Of, yeah. uh, Mass tort case, I think Roundup. I think it was Roundup or Talc. I can't remember. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about you know your your journey to because uh, I see all those plaques on the back of your wall, <laughs> and I know you're you're in my mastermind with Pillman. I know that you are you you got a reputation for getting big verdicts, big settlements, and uh, top quality. You're just an A class law firm. You know, uh, but you're, you're so good. Other law firms want to want to. Uh, co counsel with you, so I know that from from uh, you've never told me that, but I know that is a fact. I, I, you know, I change out before I let you in the mastermind, so I know I know your history. <laughs> you know, well, I, I appreciate like, it. No, so tell me how you got started in law. I mean, the, tell me the whole story of how you end up where you are now. Yeah, my my journey is uh, a fairly incredible journey. I I come from very humble beginnings. Grew up um, grew up in a very small house, rented. Uh, right next to a train train track, so I could sleep through anything now because we were literally ten feet from the train track that would blow its whistle every time it came through. Um, my parents put together enough money to move to Edison, New Jersey, when I was seven. Moved to Edison from South Amboy in, a, in the smallest house in Edison, New Jersey. I grew up with one pair of sneakers, one pair of jeans, a couple t-shirts, one jacket. And, you know, I was the first one in my family to go to college. And the only reason I went to college is because I could hit a 90 mile an hour fastball. So I was I was gifted in athletics. I was not a good student. I was a construction worker from the age of 14. So what I really concentrated on, I thought it was going to be a carpenter or a framer, just like my father. And then in high school, I remember getting an athletic scholarship and a young lady that sat next to me said, she was very jealous. And she said, it doesn't matter. You're going to flunk out of school anyway. And I thought about that. And I said, you know what? She might be right. So when I went to college, all I did was study. I got on the dean's list and I maintained a very high grade point average throughout my college career, even though it was very challenging playing baseball every day. And I went to school in South Carolina and we, we had to be on the field with our three miles run by two o'clock, all stretched out. So we had classes from eight to 12, played baseball every day, worked out every day, extra batting practice, but still maintain to keep good grades. And I graduated in three and a half years and I taught for a half a semester because I was a double major, history and secondary education. And one of the career advisors, they call them now, we call them guidance counselor in our day, Ken, said to yeah. me in that beautiful Southern drawl that you have, then, you know, Mr. LeBrock, with your grades, I think you can get a scholarship to law school. Did you ever consider uh, going to law school? And I said, no, but if somebody's going to pay for it, I will go. Because I was <laughs> teaching at Belton Honeypath High School. They offered me a position. I was going to get my doctorate in history from Clemson and be a professor of history. So I ended up getting into Mississippi College School of Law. I applied to a couple others. Nova at the time wasn't even accredited. I think it was Campbell University, which is on a mountain somewhere in beautiful North Carolina. Still don't know exactly where that is. But I got in and I ended up going to Jackson, Mississippi, graduated law school, received an LLM, which is a, as you know, is a postdoctorate degree in law from King's College, London School of Economics in international finance. And I was in the international financial sector for a few years. And I came back home and where, if you're going to open up your own law firm, where do you do it? Your hometown where with a name like LeBrock, it's very unusual. People remember the name. And I ended up opening up my own law firm in the early nineties. And then that really progressed into a partnership. Um, and then I got an offer from my two partners right now in 2007. I was a partner in another firm and they made me that proverbial offer. I couldn't refuse and I came over to Garces Grabler, which is now Garces Grabler and LeBrock. Great. And so what y'all, what's your main practice areas now? We do, we're injury lawyers. We concentrate on personal injury and workers' compensation. We have a significant number of cases. We have 
approximately 2,700 personal injury cases and about 4,000 workers' comp cases. But we have a lot of lawyers. We have over 30 lawyers uh, we handle the, can handle those cases. Absolutely. So that you, you've grown uh, significantly. Uh, we have 12 offices right now, um, you know, 11 in New Jersey and one in Philadelphia. Wow. Wow. So what, you know, we, we've been through all this COVID and everything. What, what's like been the biggest challenge of y'all of your practice in the last several years? What, what are you seeing the biggest challenges? Large. I think by by growing the quality of the personnel in the office is probably the greatest challenge. And what the reason we've been so successful is when I first came to the firm, it didn't have the reputation it did now. It does now. Um, now we are considered to be a top litigation law firm. We do not undersettle cases. And what that has done is great lawyers want to work with us. You know, we have so many, we have great resumes in, for our personal injury department that we have to turn very good lawyers away because we have an incredible litigation team now. And that is the toughest challenge is to bring in great talent, because as you're probably aware, I may have even learned this at Pilma, the two keys to the value of a case is the lawyer handling the case and their contact with the client so they can empathize and actually understand what the client's going through. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. And some firms miss that, especially firms that market. Uh, they tend to, you know, I know I did a lot of marketing when I, when I started my PI firm in 96. And, uh, but I said, I don't want to be a meal. I want, I want to give, you know, I want to work the case. I, mean, I want to, every case we take, I want to take it like we're going to try it, even though I know we're not, but we want to prep it from the beginning. If we do that and talk to the client and even, you know, get to know them and what they're going through and talk to them on a monthly basis, you're going to do a better job. You're going to get a better results. You're going to have happier clients. I couldn't agree more. We contact our clients. We, it's part of our, everyday routine that you have to contact 10 clients per per team and a team is an attorney and they're two paralegals so no one handles more than 150 cases most people have about 120 so if you think about that every 12 business days we're touching base with our clients we don't get if anything people are tired of hearing from us and we don't get those complaints oh i never hear from my lawyer because we're touching base so often and it allows us to follow up on their care, make, make sure they're seeing the right doctors, they're treating correctly, and they're trying to get themselves as healthy as they can. So that's a very important a, a part of our firm is that the way you treat your clients, and our, our one of our keys here is treat clients like family. That's our number one key performance indicator or... Uh, whatever you would like to call them. You know, we have our core values, I guess you could call it as well. And it's treat clients like family, never be outworked. And as you said, we prepare every case for litigation. I personally value, believe it or not, 2,700 files in the personal injury department. I put a value on them because I do have 36 years of experience. I'm 60. I started when I was 34. And I've been an arbitrator for 30 years and a mediator for the court. So I value every case. And everyone in the firm knows if they undersettle a case, they no longer have a job here. It's automatic grounds for termination if you undersettle a case. You can try a case and lose because if you've tried enough cases like I have, Ken, and I'm sure you have, you're going to lose. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're always going to lose some cases, but you're going to win most of them. So. Yep. We I had a wise, had a very wise lawyer tell me one time, this very young in my career, he said, uh, if you never lose a case, then you're not trying enough cases. He that's says, I'm true. telling you. Because you have to push that envelope to the point where you're willing to try everything. You know, we have we have young lawyers here, and what that does is because everyone knows that we're willing to try a case, they're going to settle cases with us because the greatest fear of loss for the insurance company is to be hit above 
the value that they put on that case because they put a reserve, as you know, doing this forever. There's a reserve on every case. Yeah. And if you hit them for over that, sometimes insurance adjusters lose their jobs. Sometimes attorneys lose their jobs. So yeah. that's where you have to attack them because they do not want to pay full value on any claim. Yep. Makes them look better. That's that's for sure. Yeah. I mean, I actually remember uh, I was at a mediation one time and the uh, adjuster did not have enough reserves to settle the case. And then we had to postpone it and come back. That adjuster was not there anymore. And I asked what happened. I said, they said she got fired. Yeah, I mean, it, ha it really actually happened because they got to the mediation. They, they knew they were not going to, they knew they, they knew the case was way undervalued and it's, uh, it's a death case. And uh, yeah, so that does happen. I mean, I felt bad for the adjuster because she really wasn't a bad adjuster, but she just uh, undervalued the case. I mean, you know, and uh, we didn't just settle. We we filed a lawsuit. Went, we had the mediation. And we, we did sell it the second mediation, though. So I thought that was good. Um, but anyway, and so not, when you went to the law firm in 2007 that you're with now, but how many lawyers did they have then, Lawrence? Oh, not nearly as many as we have now. I think we had um, maybe four or five in the entire personal injury department. Now yeah. we have over over 20 in the personal injury department. I think closer to 25 in the personal injury department. I should know the count off the top of my head, but I think it's, I think it's 23. Yeah. Well, I don't know about you, but I remember when I, we got kind of big, I couldn't, you know, there for years, I could know everybody in the firm's name, but then I'd start walking down the hallway and see new people and did not know who they were. I knew most of the lawyers, but I really didn't know every staff member in there. And it's, it was sad in a way, but then it was a way, the other way it was, hey, hey, we're growing, you know, that's, well, that's yeah, the way it is. That's, um, part, that's part of the growing pains, especially with us. We have, you know, with the 12 different offices, we have four or five events every year scheduled. You know, we have a kickoff breakfast. Everybody gets together. And that's where you talk about all the wonderful things you did the last year and what your goals are for this for the following year. Then we have a get together this this spring. We rented out um, a party deck at a minor league baseball team the somerset patriots up here and it's friends and, and it's friends and family bring whoever you want come to these games have some fun this summer we have an open picnic barbecue where we play a softball game and it's friends and family again and we just had a bolero night up here a bowling night where you know some people don't want to bowl but they can eat and drink and have fun and it helps build culture and then every year we throw a holiday party which is like a wonderful wedding reception it's it's incredible and people get together. We have our, and also just to keep the camaraderie, we have biweekly huddles with the entire firm. Um, so everybody's in contact with each other. We have all of our lead attorneys have quarterly meetings where we get together, we share ideas. And I've learned because I'm the old guy now, I speak last because if I say what I think, then nobody else wants to contradict me. So I want everybody, you know, to, partake in the meetings from the youngest attorney to the oldest and most seasoned attorney. So we can all learn from each other. Yeah. Never too old to learn something new. I know that for a fact. No. So Tim, what was your biggest challenge? Like from going from like, you know, four or five lawyers to, you know, almost 30 lawyers over, you know, 10, 15 year period. You know, other than, other than just getting quality personnel in it's, it, it's amazing how you can progress with the challenges. It's one of those things I tell young lawyers, you don't know what you don't know. And as being a litigator for 34 of my 36 years, all I did was litigate cases. Then I became the CEO of the firm and I oversee the cases and I'll only take on and, and try seven figure cases now. Uh, but that opened my eyes to all the things that great law firms were doing. So in the past two years, we've really grown. We've grown our revenue $11 million just by what I've learned from groups like Pilma, by going across the country and learning from the best of the best, the greatest minds, the top 
managing partners from attorneys, the top COOs of attorneys, CFO, CEOs. You know, so when you're getting the ideas from the best around the country it, and you just implement those things into your firm, it smooths out the wheels. You know, we were running right along, but maybe they were we weren't running on squares, but maybe we had octagons under the vehicle. And now we're smoothing out those rough edges and allowing us to be more productive and to be a better firm and service our clients even better than we were. So, yeah. So I know you, how long have you been in a PIMA mastermind? I know you have been in a a long, a couple of years, a couple of years. Yeah. So what would you tell people out there that are listening about the mastermind? I mean, what's the, the pros and the cons. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I'm, you know, I mean, I'm very transparent. I don't try to sell a bill of goods, but no, what do you I think? I think the the there really aren't any cons to being in a mastermind group. I guess you could be if you're paranoid. I guess the one con would be you're sharing your ideas and what's been successful. But I've always been a believer in the more you give, the more you get in return. So I'm not I'm not afraid to share my ideas because. In a mastermind group, the law firms that I'm competing with aren't in the same mastermind that I'm in. Yeah. Uh, so market market I, exclusive. It, yeah. it is. It's market exclusive. So I don't have to worry about that. And I share ideas. You know, I've learned so much from various law firms, like the way Mike McCready runs his law firm, the way um, Mike Morse runs his law firm. And there's so many top lawyers from all around the country that you can just gather ideas from, share ideas. What's working? What's not working? What have you tried? How to work out for you? As far as software, like what case management system to use? What CRM to use? What marketing companies are good? I've learned, Ken, in the last two years being a CEO, more marketing than I ever knew existed or cared to learn. But you learn all about it. SEO, you learn, you know, you learn about social media, you're you're learning about OTT advertising, traditional advertising, billboards. Ken, two years ago, we had zero billboards. We have 90 billboards now up in the state of New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Oh and, gosh. you know, our web traffic, 90 percent of it is from our billboards. You know, people are just coming in to see who the hell we are because we have so many billboards. And the credibility that that gives you, and I won't use the name, but there is a multi-billionaire that owns several surgical centers here, a huge organization. He doesn't come to meet anybody. You have to go to him. He calls me up out of the blue one day and says, hey, let's go have lunch at a restaurant up in North Jersey. I said, sure. And the reason being, he says, man, you guys must be killing it. I see all of your billboards. And it's amazing that the impression of the billboards had on a billionaire, imagine what it does to the average person. You know, they think we're, I'm not going to say we're not a great law firm because we really are, or we care about our clients and we're very good at what we do. But now everybody recognizes that. And we're not, we're no different than we were two years ago. Maybe we hired a couple other very good lawyers, but the change wasn't dramatic, but the perspective or what people think, what the reality is now be, is that we are a monster law firm in New Jersey. And we were before with you know 12 full offices and they're not PO boxes, they're fully staffed offices. And right. I think we own nine of the uh, 12 offices. We rent three of them. You know, that, that goes back to something that I've said many, many times. You can have build the best mousetrap in the world but if people don't know about it, they're not going to use it. Same thing, you'd be the best lawyer in your state. But if nobody knows about you, it, it's not going to, you know. And that, you're right, it's all about perception. People, you know, and that's why marketing works. I mean, you know, whether we like it or not. I remember when I first decided to start marketing in 96, 97, my partners would not do it. I had to leave and start my own firm. Did I really want the market? No. But... I was seeing what was happening around me. You got to, you got to adapt, you got to pivot. And then, you know, there was a lot of lawyers on TV in North Carolina. And I remember I walked in the courtroom one day and one of my clients was there in criminal court because I did DWIs and he had been T-boned by a transfer truck on crutches, broken leg. 
And I said, you know, we do that. He said, yeah, but I got the guy off TV. I figure he must really be good if he's on TV. Right. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so yeah. it's all about perception. Uh, even though this lawyer had never tried a case in his life, but he was a great marketer. And I, and he, since then, has hired a lot of really great lawyers. And so I can't really say anything. But at that time, no, it, it's all, it was all about perception. So it is perception. I think, I think yeah. it's a good thing. I think lawyers that are good lawyers, Oh, have a duty to advertise and market because if not, then all that's left is the bad lawyers right. <laughs> that don't know how to try cases, that don't know how to don't don't answer calls, don't look after the clients. So I think it's just the opposite. I think the good lawyers should be. If not, then only the bad lawyers will. We don't want that's that's what gives us a bad name, you know, as ambulance chasers. So well, it's in the industry, we all know who the great lawyers are and who the good law firms are, but yeah. the average person doesn't. So they go to the one that they see and they know. And there are some law firms out here in, in you know, the tri-state area that really advertise a lot, but we know they're going to undersettle the case. Uh, but we don't. And as you said before, people didn't know the ability of our lawyers to try cases even though for 20 years I've been trying cases for some of the top law firms have been referring me their cases to try, as you as you mentioned earlier. But who would know that outside of the industry? Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's, that's something that people don't know. So now we market heavily so people will know who we are. So what, what are you most proud of about your accomplishments in uh, you know, I think I'm most proud of um, representing injured people. Look, I'm not a priest, a rabbi. I'm not a psychiatrist. All I can do in this profession is get somebody the most money possible to improve their quality of life from the injuries that they've suffered. So I feel I, very good about certain people that have been horrifically injured that I've gotten them a lot of money. I can't put them back together. I'm not a doctor, but I have gotten them a significant amount of money where they can enjoy their lives the most they can with the disabilities that they have. What's the last book you read? The last book I, I've read? Oh, geez. I've, I've read so many, you know, marketing books. I just I just reread, oh geez, multipliers is probably the one I just reread that again. Yeah. And you know, because as a leader, I want to try to multiply um my abilities and have people that want to create other good lawyers that are great for culture and just keep the dynamic of our firm going. That's that's amazing. I was actually uh I'm getting ready to go cut some videos uh for my social media and different things. And I'm pulling out the whole deal about multipliers, about the ministers and multipliers, yep. what a minister does, what a multiplier does. And you know, really what it comes down to, I think, and you can you just read it so you might have a different take. But I think really what it comes down to is really good leaders are multipliers because they try to coach other people up to be up, be good leaders like themselves. And it's all about trying to raise that person up. Whereas the ministers are worried about somebody getting ahead of them climbing over top of them or they, they don't have their self-confidence or they just, you know, they micromanage them to death. They don't give them any freedom. They don't give them any encouragement. And people like that, the ministers can kill a business they can. And, and morale. I mean, you they, know, and that's, so that tells, that tells me a lot. If you're reading books like that, Lawrence, I kind of understand how you've grown so good, you know, <laughs> well, because that's I, what it takes. It takes a good leader. I mean, it really does. It really does. And, you know, as in multipliers, what I've done is, and it was very frightening to, if you're a litigator, look, 34 years of doing something, I was in my comfort zone. You know, I was, I was a top dog in litigation, very, very successful a trial lawyer. And I always made the most money in the firm. I generated the biggest verdicts, made the most money. So when I was stepping back, I had trained a couple younger associates and we figured, all right, we're going to lose a little bit of money from in my team. But if I can go around and teach all the other lawyers the techniques that have been successful for me and what I've seen successful for others, we could pull all the other teams up. And I think by doing that, we were up $4 million in our first year and another $7 million this year in our gross revenue because of just sharing the knowledge and bringing the younger 
guys and gals at the firm up, their knowledge base, their ability, and their confidence, because it helps if they know they're handling a huge case that I'm going to try it for them. So they could be a little bit more confident. They don't have to be afraid to, oh, geez, I'm going to have to go try this case alone because they know if it's a seven figure case, I'm there with them. So, so if somebody's out there, you know, and they're at like four or five lawyers, they're trying to figure out how can I get, you know, to 30 lawyers and they get these big verdicts. What, what would you tell them? Don't be afraid to take in a lot of cases. You know, if you, in the, Tri-state area, we have something called the lawsuit threshold. And a lot of attorneys don't want to take a lawsuit threshold because there's six criteria, you know, broken bone, loss of fetus, horrific scarring. Um, but the catch-all is a permanent injury that will never heal. And people don't want to take cases because the defense is always going to bring in their multi-million dollar defense doctor from Harvard or Yale to say that the person doesn't have a permanent injury, that they healed, they're all better. I would say you take those cases in and try them, get a reputation of being a litigator, not being afraid to try cases, and work them up properly. Get them to the right doctors. Make sure, and I'm not saying if somebody's tapped from behind, you take that case when they're not really injured, but when somebody's really injured, because in New Jersey, 92% of the cases that are lawsuit threshold lose a trial. 92% lose. So you have to be willing to get in the ring and try those cases and win a few in order to be able to settle. It's almost like as a kid, and growing up in a rough neighborhood like I did. How do you stay out of fights? You get in a few fights. If you're willing to get in a few fights, the bullies back off even though they still might be able to kick your butt, they don't want to go through that effort. They're going to pick on the weak, the weak person. Same thing when in litigation. If they know you're willing to get in the ring and try a case, they're more likely to settle with you for a full value because they don't want to get into that fight and take the chance of losing. Yeah. And, and that, that really has an effect. So I would say take in a lot of cases, try a lot of cases, and improve your technique and your art where I walk into a courtroom, I'm as comfortable as I am talking to you right now, Ken. I am very comfortable in a courtroom because I've done it so often. It's like home. It's like going to watching, you know, watching a ball game on my couch. It's, it's second nature. It's like brushing your teeth. But so many people are intimidated. And people say, I mean, how can you be intimidated? There's eight jurors in a box that don't know anything about the law. And you're afraid to talk to them? And I don't understand it. Maybe it's the fear of losing, but you have to get in and improve your art and your technique and become a better litigator. I think it's the fear of losing. And I think, I'll be honest with you, and you might not agree, but I think some lawyers are just pure lazy. Just being well, it, is, it is a lot of I, work. I do know that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> trying the case, I used to, you know, I tried, I never got the big verdicts like you did, but I tried a lot of cases. I mean, I got some big verdicts, but very few. But the thing about it is I wasn't scared to go and try a case. But trying the case to me was the fun part. It was the prep that was so hard because if you did the prep right, then the case, trying the case was easy. Yeah. Because, you, you you know, you want to know more than anybody in that courtroom about the case. More than the defense lawyer, more than the judge, more than the juries, more than the witnesses. And if you do that, most of the time you're going to come out on top. I mean, sometimes you're going to lose just the way it works. I've lost so much, you have won. I've won so much, you have lost. Yeah. That's life, you know? And what you just said, Ken, is I was told that was some great advice I received from probably the scariest law professor I ever had. He was a Harvard grad with an LLM from Harvard. He was brilliant. And he said, when you get out into the real world, you're going to be trying cases against lawyers that are much more seasoned than yourself, he said, but the one thing you can do is you can know your case better than them. Know your case inside and out. And so to this day, if I try a case and you may have six red wells full of paperwork and, you know, we work on a computer now. I read, I go through every piece of paper in that file and on my computer to make sure I didn't miss something yeah. in my preparation. I do not want to miss a thing because I'll tell you what. That damn defense lawyer, if he's good, he's not going to miss it. And that's kind of the difference. I think if you have two seasoned litigators, the facts will decide the case. 
because neither one's going to make a fatal mistake. Right. But if you have inexperienced attorneys, they sometimes make fatal mistakes that you could take advantage of. That's true. That's true. Um, um, I've had it done to me when I was young, and I've done it to other younger, younger ones <laughs> too when, when I was older. Yes. Yeah, I had one defense lawyer that got fired after a case uh, because he just said there was no way to lose this case, and, they, and she lost it. I felt bad for her, but, you know, that's, that's it happens. It. I actually had a lawyer call the adjuster and then call her boss before the jury got out of the courtroom because she thought she was going to lose her job after a very high verdict I received on a case that she should have won. So she was very frightened and, you know, she was just like, well, you know, well, you know like that's, that's why they run the races. I mean, you know, it's like, that's like this college football. I mean, you know, they say, well, you four best teams, da, da, da. But the deal was Oregon, Oregon was favored over Washington State, Washington last, last Friday night, and Washington won. Right. Uh, uh, Georgia was favored over Alabama. Alabama won. You know, that's why, you know, you can have the, you can, that's why they play the games. That's why they run the races. Exactly. Because you never know. It's it's a jury. People say, well, what's the jury going to do? I said, you have a better chance of guessing, throwing dice against the wall and uh, guessing the number than you do having a uh, knowing what a jury is. And I can give you a quick story of that. Normally, you want six jurors as a plaintiff lawyer. You don't want the eight is the you know what the statistics say. But I had eight jurors. And instead of dropping it down to six and making two of them alt alternates, I let all eight juries de jurors deliberate because I had a guy in the front row that I knew I had him in my pocket, nodding his head. I had this guy and I was scared to death I was going to lose him. I said, this guy is going to be my champion. So we tried the case. It was a three plus million dollar verdict. And they walk outside and the jurors come up to me and said, oh, can we talk to you? I said, really, I'm not supposed to talk to, about the, the case. I said, it could go up on appeal. I'm not really allowed to say anything right now. And they, and the one guy looked at me that I knew I had. He says, well, you, I don't want to ask you anything. He says, I didn't believe your client at all. <laughs> the guy I knew I had was the one, it was a 7-1 jury verdict. And the one guy that I thought I had was the one against me. So you know, you know, you could read all the books you want on jurors and jury selection, and you still and you have the guy nodding at you to yeah. every word you say, not paying attention to the defense lawyer, and he's the guy who doesn't believe a word yeah. coming out of your client's mouth. So it's amazing. I, I used to have a favorite saying when I go to mediation, my client, you know, they were talking about she said, Well, what do you think? I would always give them a range. I said, but let me tell you, I said, go in the court, I said. I love to go to court, but I got, if I lose the case, I, I got, you know, a hundred more to try next year. I said, but it's your only case. I said, so you need to do what, you know? And I said, another thing I used to say is what a jury would do. I said, what a little, I said, the two things you never know is what a little boy's got in his pocket and what a jury would do. <laughs> it's true. I've you never, know, I never used the second one, but I use the first one a lot. I've told every one of my clients going to trial. You know, when I'm prepping them, I, I talk to them and I prepare their questions and I talk to them about what the answer, you know, what answers are they going to give? We go back and forth and I tell them, you have one shot. You know, we have 2,700 cases. You have one. You know, pay attention and go in there and listen to your lawyer. Read your questions, your answers, read the material that we're giving you so you're well prepared. Well, this has been great. Uh Lawrence, I appreciate you taking time to be here with us, and I appreciate your uh, your contributions to our mastermind group. Uh, you know, and like I said, I know you said you've learned a lot, but you you've taught a lot too. So for that, I appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thanks a lot, Ken. It was my pleasure being here, and I look forward to our next mastermind. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to be in Key West. Yes, I, I will. I will be there. <laughs> But this right. time I'm going, I'm going a little earlier, Ken. The last time I went, I got there late at night, drove in the dark, stayed at the hotel. We went out to dinner one night and I went back to the hotel in the dark and I left early the next morning in the dark. So I didn't even get to see the ocean other than the view from the hotel when I was there. So oh I'm going God. to enjoy Key West a little bit this you, time. You ought to. I actually go down there. I'm in a house and stay down there the whole month. This, that's okay. my part of getting away from the cold. 
cold up here in, in the Carolinas, which is not as probably bad as it is in Jersey. In no, Atlanta. no, it's a little chilly up here now. It's jacket yeah. weather now. Yeah. But so if anybody wants to, uh, the name of your firm and your, your your URL or your phone number or anything in case any lawyers out there want to refer your cases or associate you with cases in New Jersey. That would be great. Sure. The name of the firm is Garces Grabler and LeBrock. I'm Lawrence LeBrock. Our website is uh, www.gglwins.com. You can also go to gglawyers.com and look us up. And please, whenever you're choosing a lawyer, do your due diligence, research your lawyers and compare them because every lawyer gets paid the same. They get a percentage of the amount that you win. So get the best lawyer you can get. Yeah, I agree. You know, and I'll, I'll end with one thing because this is something another real wise lawyer told me. He says, you know how to get a million dollar verdict? I said, no. He said, screw up a $3 million case. <laughs> That's very true. That could happen. I think he said how to easily you know how you know how to easily get a million dollar verdict. I said no. He said screw up a three million dollar case. That's true. So That's something true. to leave on. Think about. Well, listen. Have take care. Have a great holidays. Uh, if I don't see you before, I will see you in Key West at the Pimble Mastermind Meet, the uh, Eight Figure Group. All right. Well, enjoy the holidays, Ken. Take care. All right. You too. Until next time, this is Ken Hardison, dedicated to your success.